Hello, everybody. Monday night, we've got a guy coming on here, a gentleman I've been wanting to speak with on television for a long time. He runs a fine, fine talk show out of Chicago. His name is Irv Cupsonet, and it's the first time, I think, that we've had him on the program, along with a good man from New York City named Long John Neville, who, get a load of this, is on the air on WMCA Radio from midnight until 6 o'clock in the morning, six nights a week. And then they rerun a tape program on the Sunday night show. So the man is operating on the air for 72 hours a week here in New York City on WMCA. And I tell you, that's a lot. And so Irvin Long, John will be my guest here on Monday. And then, of course, on Wednesday from Toronto, we have Xavier Hollander, who is the happy hooker. It'll be a great show, we hope. Last night, I said to Harwin Ellison, my friend from California, that you never see people using the facilities on television. Nobody ever goes to the bathroom. Had a phone call from Sally Struthers to correct me. All in the Family is the first program to use the bathroom scene. She also said that Norman Lear had a fight with the censors before it was approved. What else is new? However, it was approved, and they used it, and they got a 10-second laugh. So I stand corrected there. Items in the news. I have an item for the boys tonight and the girls. Wait, hold it. I'll be right with you. Item in the news. A 50-mile-per-hour wind wiped out the screen tower at the Queens Drive-In Theater in Charlotte, North Carolina, earlier this month, forcing cancellation of the movie. The name of the film being shown? Guess it. Go on. Gone with the wind. Come on. Way ahead of you. Right back after these announcements to talk about quitting smoking. I hope we help you. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. Thank you. Susan Goldberg's train, and she's the only one besides me who knows what that means, except for some people in the room. Thanks, Susan. Quitting smoking. I, I, I suppose I should tell all the stories at the beginning of how hard I've tried, but they'll come out as we go through the hour. But here are some people who are actively engaged in the business of helping people get rid of the evil weed. Damon is a Michigan-based hypnotist who hypnotizes groups of people to rid themselves of all bad habits, especially eating too much and smoking at all. His success rate, 87% of this man's patients now report positive results. He is an ex-smoker himself, an alumnus of Marquette in Milwaukee. Marquette is playing at the Garden tonight. And he says life is too short and too rich to be hampered by debilitating habits. He's also from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. What a town. Jackie Rogers, the founder of Smoke Enders here in New York. We did something with this organization on the local news program. And one of our correspondents, Norma Quarles, was very, very successful in ridding herself of the habit. And he or she herself, Ms. Rogers, was a compulsive smoker for over 20 years, about 22 years. And I trust you are now off the evil weed. Free. You have ended. She is free. See, that's the old key word. I'm yes. still a slave. You're still free. June Walser is from the American Cancer Society, where she is voluntary director of their Manhattan Chapter's Stop Smoking program. And June also is an ex-smoker. She that's gave up right. smoking five years ago. Seven and Seven a half. and a half <laughs> years ago. All right, gang, tell me how it works, because there are so many millions of us who have tried, and it has been of no avail. Well, I have come to believe that most people would like to quit smoking. Um, they sincerely feel that they can't quit. They've taught themselves to believe that it's impossible to quit because they've tried so often and failed so often. And I think that the only reason they don't quit is because they don't know how. And I think they don't know how because it's very complicated. Oh, but there is a way to quit. That's simply not to buy them anymore and, <laughs> not, and, and, and not to smoke them anymore. But that's where the problem comes in. Yes. Because when that phone rings in the morning... That's right. <laughs> right. Well, the yeah. trouble is, is when you don't buy them anymore, you start smoking OPs. Mm -hmm. Other you people, know, and, and yes. And they hate you even worse, right? I mean, it's not yeah, a matter of... Yeah, but OPs are still your problem. <laughs> oh, always they that's are, right. definitely. There's it's no argument just there. Just because you call it other people. Uh, well, it's the kind of degrading thing, though, that you go through for getting other people's or playing games with yourself, I think that does the most damage. Um, I'm, myself, uh, didn't get any support or encouragement <laughs> because of the health scare or the news of the diseases that would be caused by smoking. Mm -hmm. It didn't help me at all. I knew all of that. My husband taught it to me very patiently mm -hmm. through all this pathology. What I've read so much about smoking yeah. and diseases, I've decided to quit it, reading. Right. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> or it makes me right. so nervous when I know all that, I have to smoke more. You know, there was a great story told one time. I believe the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a great anti-smoking program, yeah, which they uh, right. run in conjunction with films yeah. of an operation on a person's lung. Right. right. And somebody once told me when I was at one of these... Uh, 
quit smoking clinics. They, mm -hmm. they said, we went to see this picture of the lung operation. We got out of the theater, and everybody said, my God, that was awful. Give me a <laughs> cigarette. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's, twice but that's, that's true, but it's an exa that's exactly the problem, I think, with most pro uh, efforts to quit smoking. People think that if uh, you approach a smoker intellectually and say, my dear, you're a damn fool for smoking, uh, you know the danger it's doing to you. Life is very good. You shouldn't cut it short or destroy the quality of your life while you're alive. Intellectually, then, you know it's bad. You should quit smoking. Well, that's, what the th that's what's wrong. The premise is wrong. Smoking is not a rational um, situation. That's right. It's completely irrational. It, it isn't an intellectual exercise. We smoke because of emotional reasons as well, as well as physiological reasons. I didn't think I could ever quit smoking. I really didn't. It was so deeply ingrained in everything I did, everything I did, not just the phones and the car, the ignition keys and the cocktails and talking to people. It was everything I did. I was just an absolute compulsive smoker, and I, I just thought I could never quit. Smoking is a nervous habit that has nothing at all to do with quieting your nerves. Yes, that's I had true. this pointed up to me. I went through this program, and I won't mention it because it's a commercial venture, mm -hmm. uh, of aversion therapy whereby small wires are attached to your arm mm -hmm. and you are placed at a table and you are told to sit down and smoke, not to inhale. And you sit at the table and they must have had 8,000 cigarette butts piled up on this table. Wow. And then they have all these pictures of uh, alive with flavor. Uh, Freshen your taste. Uh, it's springtime, light one up. And you're looking at these pictures of beautiful men and women in cool mountainsides, and you're smoking these terrible things. And every time you take a puff, they put some voltage in your arm. Mm -hmm. And you begin to realize that all the things we have come to associate with smoking cigarettes, like cups of coffee and lovely conversations and cocktails and after dinners, if you take all that away and just sit and think about smoking, it's a terrible, terrible thing to do. They taste awful. There's no well, question about it. The point right. is, it's a learned habit. It is something that you learn to associate with getting up in the morning, with the coffee, with the telephone. And it is also associated, as Jackie says, with emotion. So that there are a variety of things that you associate them with, and you keep reinforcing that association every time you take a cigarette. So in order to stop smoking or become an ex-smoker, you have to unlearn a habit. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And in addition, yes. in addition, I of think course. the thing that's little recognized and not very often spoken about, Tom, is the fact that nicotine is addictive. And uh, this is well, one of the great secrets of our civilization. <laughs> now, you see, that's an interesting uh, th thing to talk about because the, one of the ones that I went through with the, with the wires mm, again, and there I'm was more to it than that, mm, right. yes. uh, they kept saying to us that nicotine was not addictive. They said, oh, there are a small percentage of people who might become addicted to nicotine, mm -hmm. but mostly the body really develops no craving for nicotine. Mm -hmm. Baloney. Yes, I what did you right, say Well, right away that. I said to myself, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one of the one half of one percent who right. are addicted to nicotine, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I can't kick it. Tom, that's exactly how I felt. I thought certainly everyone else was in control, that they wanted to smoke because they enjoyed it. And you they loved them, it. didn't they, you? Of course. You loved them. Sure. Course. I couldn't live without them is what it was. Yeah, but your whole point is, But I, I didn't really, you see. The, the point that I learned when I did my research was that I discovered that, first of all, it was addictive. I wasn't weak-willed. It depends Hallelujah. on... It Secondly, I didn't really enjoy the damn things. It was just I was so miserable without them that when I took a puff, I thought, oh, relief, heaven, you know, mm -hmm. and I was taught to believe that this See, was See, I never really worry about enjoying cigarettes, but I have them in th uh, doing things I love, like some evenings oh. I'm sitting here talking with fascinating people, and, yes, oh, boy, I have a cigarette, it's great, or course, you're out right. and you're having a wonderful little yeah. party with cocktails, well. and there they are on the table, and let's have one. But, you know, the thing that, I, that interests me most of all, now, I've, I've read case histories of something like 70,000 smokers since I started this thing eight, nine years ago. They all have the same feelings. They all say the same things. They say, just as you're saying, they use the same rationalizations. They say, but I enjoy smoking, and it's the only thing I do that's bad. It's my only vice, and I have to die of something anyhow. I might as well die a few years younger. They go through this whole liturgy. They all say the same thing, but what I've learned is that none of us know that every other smoker is saying the same Feels thing. Feels exactly the same yes, way. Right. That's right. Oh, sure. When I talk, I deal with groups of people. We deal in like 50 people at a time, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I stand up in front of them and say, are there any questions? And they start asking questions, and I begin describing how they, you know, they'll feel in trying to quit smoking. Uh, like the telephone pole starting to look like cigarettes, or we're going to fix it. <laughs> and they do. They do. I swear to God they do. I, they did when I tried to quit by myself. 
uh, that we're going to fix it so that they can start the car with only keys and not keys and a pack of cigarettes and a telephone will come off the hook and all this sort of thing. And most people are amazed that everybody else feels the same yes, way. Right. And you get this whole group of people almost feeling as one person or as one identical, you know, uh, being. Damon, what's the word for that? When everybody feels the same thing but they don't know that everyone else has experienced feeling the same having the same experience. That's called the, surprise, I no, think. No, the <laughs> social psychologists, I believe, have, have word, oh, two words, but this, I lost it. Some years ago, I knew this word, uh, and it You mean most like when you think it. you're the only yeah. one in the yes. room who's had too many at the cocktail That's party right. because you don't know that everybody well, that else has had it, but along with you, right. right. That is a phenomenon right. of, of the social psychologists, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they, cla they have a word for this, is what we smokers, and I consider myself still a smoker, I still know what it was like to try to quit that we smokers feel about this. We are all trapped in the same little situation, feeling very sorry for ourselves, feeling very hopeless, very discouraged, certain that we can never quit. And knowing that you are in control. You, if you're smoking, you enjoy it, and if you want to quit, you can quit. But I'm different. Every smoker feels that Everybody they're hopeless. Feels that well, that's that's the purpose, purpose, that they're helpless. That's you know the purpose why? of a group. You see, when people come together, they, quitting smoking is a very lonely process. And I've heard this from many people. Now, after you've talked to maybe a thousand or two thousand smokers, you begin to hear the same things running through their fears and their wants and their wishes and their desires. Exactly. And when you, uh, when you get them together in a group, they find out that they're not alone. That somehow you feel the same mm -hmm. way I do, and you're going through the same problem I am. And, well, maybe, you know, I, I, I can do it, but I can do it with you. Mm -hmm. And this is what the group does. The group gives the person the emotional support to do it on his own, because it's usually done on your own. I, uh, I, I got to tell you that uh, from my experience, I don't buy that, because there, was, there, there, there were two other people who were mm. in my class, as it were, mm. who flunked out. <laughs> and we hated to fail in front of the other <clears throat> 14 or 15 people that were in the group. But nonetheless, we did fail, mm -hmm. and we were really ashamed of ourselves. Well, if I were to, if I were to run into somebody now who was in my group with me, and, and this person would still be off cigarettes, I'd feel terribly ashamed no, of myself. But you didn't fail. You just didn't succeed as yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of true. That's like, no, you're not. Okay. No, you must. You must. You you're must. not rich. You simply don't have any money. Yet. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, no. It's a pejorative word that you're using against yourself that undermines your efforts in trying to quit. Trying to quit smoking is a long process. It starts with your no. hearing the Surgeon General's report a long time ago that perhaps you... What Surgeon General's report? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. No, I, don't I don't know what Surgeon General's <laughs> I really don't think that trying to quit is a long process, though, simply because learning to make the decision to quit smoking may be the long process. Yes, that's... But once yes. you decide to... Once yes. you decide to no, it doesn't ask, have no. to be. It doesn't it. have to be so long, Damon, but I there's parts I of it. Damon, take, mm. wait, let me ask Damon something. Yeah. The last resort that I had was a hypnotic consultant in Southern California. Okay. And I went to this man and we went through the ritual where I had to learn to trust him. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. in fact, I want to go through this ritual with you after these announcements and tell what happened uh, with my okay. hypnotic experience and then you can tell whether that's what you do or not or something different and where I went wrong because it was my court of last resort and I was found guilty. I still have, you know, millions <laughs> of them out here. Uh, and we'll be right back after these announcements and I hope all of you will stay tuned. Thank you. The hypnotist told me that it was all mind over matter. And okay. for example, he took a cigarette out and, er, and lit it, mm -hmm. lighted it, mm -hmm. and then put it out in his hand and said, you see, my mind is telling my flesh not to burn. Mm -hmm. And his flesh didn't burn. I thought, you know, that okay. is really fantastic. Right. And he said, now I'm going to tell you that all the cigarettes that you smoke, and he, he put me under, right? Okay. I said, hey, I'm under, right? Tell yeah. me, give it to me, lay yeah. it on me. Sure. He says, from now on, all the cigarettes that you smoke are going to taste like horse manure. Okay. And then he gave me the old snap. I said, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I have learned to adore the taste. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Now, how does your okay. shtick differ from this guy's shtick? Oh, uh, so widely that they're not even, you know, in the same ballpark. Uh, I mean, you claim that one shot does it, right? That's right. 85 to 87 percent of the time, one session, which runs in the neighborhood of an hour to an hour and a half, well, if the person desires, get him to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't hypnotize, 
and make it impossible or difficult for the person to smoke. You don't hypnotize anybody. We do that to That's ourselves. Right. Okay, all right. You're two steps ahead of me right there. Uh, technically speaking, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. It's right. just under the guidance of the hypnotist. He pushes, he steers, and so on. If you daydream, you're already hypnotized. All right. To hypnotize somebody and say, hey, cigarettes are going to taste horrible and you will get violently ill to your stomach, etc., etc., etc. Let's face it, the first cigarette you ever had didn't taste that good. It was dizzy, out behind the barn, pale, right? Oh, horrible. dizziness, terrible. That didn't stop you from establishing the habit. Why should right now making a cigarette taste bad stop you from continuing that habit? It won't. So instead... Oh, they have all these little mints you can buy to freshen your mouth. Oh, for sure. <laughs> right? your mouth. Right. Certainly, certainly. So what we do instead, and what I do is in the session, talk to the individual's subconscious mind. Because let's face it, that's where addiction, habit, and programming and impulse comes from. You said before, it's non-rational. Conscious thinking is rational. Subconscious is irrational. All right. We go to the subconscious. We, hey, subconscious, you don't have to smoke anymore. You're not going to reach for a cigarette without thinking. You're not going to crave a cigarette with a cup of coffee. You feel good because you don't smoke. Others around you not smoking won't bother you one way or another. And then, when we're finished with this whole shtick, the habit and the craving is gone. So if the person really wants to quit, he no longer has to smoke. He's not forced to smoke by habit but and by situation. But my friend, yes. fellow warrior, bring out a Hoya <laughs> right. and all that. And all that. If somebody has decided they're going to quit, mm -hmm. that person does not have to come to see you or you or you. No, wait no, a minute. No, we Tom. make it easy for them. Yeah. Oh, we give baloney. them a system. No, Tom, I think sometimes most, that's necessary. Most people, most people think they ought to quit. Most people are told they have, a lot of people are told they have to quit but almost nobody really wants to quit, or indeed they would have stopped smoking. Now, they have some idea that there might be some improvement in the quality of their lives if they don't smoke, or their pocketbook, or something. Right. There's an outside motivation for them to quit smoking, but it isn't a meaningful motivation. And it's very important that they find themselves in the hands of someone who can help motivate them to begin to want to quit, instead of feel that they ought to quit, and as they're learning uh, to develop their motivation and their desire to quit smoking, if, if they are lucky enough to be put in the hands of someone who helps them break the habit into manageable, controllable segments, so the conditioned response aspect of it is broken, they don't respond like Pavlov's dogs every time the coffee cup clinks, that the addiction is taken care of and they're perhaps detoxified before they stop smoking, and they change their attitude about themselves so they don't make excuses for themselves for needing a cigarette to be a better performer or a better business person or a better writer and they and they improve their self-esteem they will then come to view quitting smoking as something that's very pleasant and very attractive rather than some deprivation I view it all I think that the, I think that a lot of people do want to quit it is that they have not been able to focus their energy and I think what I think what Damon does and I think what any group does is uh, focus their energy into a regimen in which they can learn how to quit. Many people come with the motivation already or they are ambivalent. And what you do is you positivize their motivation. You bring out the best in them because the cure does not lie in the method. It always lies in the person themselves. You just give them a tool. And this is the thing. The cure does not lie in the method. No, it lies in the person himself. I kind of disagree with that. I would take strong issue with that. We disagree. You bet. But I feel that a long-lasting cure, I mean, the group disappears and the encouragement and the rules disappear. The person is left with himself. And he has to live, as I have lived for seven and a half years as an ex-smoker, when I know that it was I that did it and it was my accomplishment. And when you feel that, that you are proud of that, then it is long-lasting. Well, I agree with that. It yes. has to, it's a very personal matter. That's Smoking right. is a very personal thing, and quitting is a very personal thing. And I, I would like to go on record for saying that I am not an anti-smoking -smoke, crusader. I believe mm. that if a person wants to smoke, it's entirely their own bu business. It always has to entirely. be a choice. And yes. quitting oh, is sure. a very personal thing. And so, but the method, the method is what's been missing in this country for all these years. People have wanted to quit to the degree that they are righteous or they feel proper that it should be better that they quit and not set an example for the children or something. But, and they strike out to do this and they go to one of these things or they pledge that they won't or they hide their cigarettes somewhere or they 
<laughs> buy a brand that well, they don't some like. Or make a bet with some. But some people right. this work. For some it does, yes, but right. for right. the majority, where smokers well, like me, they feel so trapped. They they learn failure. They just keep con constant failure. Everything they try, they start smoking again. They lose their self-esteem and they don't know how to lick it and they surrender. That's right. They well, give up. They're the emotionally exhausted. That's where what I am, they my friend. Need, well, I give up. That's the purpose. I give up. The purpose but is to show a smoker is a that he can do it. They need a method. Yes. It's a very complicated thing. It's not just a nasty little habit. It's a no, very complex it collection of But you cannot do it without the willingness and the power themselves. and the courage of the smoker himself. But with instruction, no. with yes. good step-by-step right. step instruction, not hit and miss, not maybe try this and do a little of that. No. But absolute instruction, it's almost the same as if you were going to build a nuclear reactor. It would be pretty bad if you went out and tried to do that because you wanted to, you saw what it was like and you had some parts and pieces and you had to throw this thing together. Mm -hmm. This smoking thing is very, very, very complicated. I have more respect for it the more I get into it. The more the important people, the people who are totally successful in their lives, who are still chained to this damn thing and lose respect for themselves. Tom, well, they are do strong. you think maybe people have the attitude, or maybe you yourself have the attitude, that smoking or the cessation of smoking is like getting rid of a headache, that you should be able to take a pill and, uh, you know, swallow it and the headache will well, be gone? America today has been well, well that's right. That's all right. That's now, right. I, 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 oh, okay, yeah, I, I sure. confess to that. I right. keep saying to myself, why don't they, obviously, if we are addicted to nicotine, why don't they create a nice little pill that That's we can right. just take in the morning? Mm -hmm. They have Three. appetite depressants. Mm -hmm. They have headache depressants. They have uh, uh, cough depressants. They have stuff to make your nose stop dripping. Eat pineapple, fresh pineapple all day. You'll never want to smoke. Um, well, you is that true? No. So, yes. The doctor told me that you, there was a certain... Five egg. orders of fresh pineapple. <laughs> yeah, you get a case of it. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, I they did develop... They, but, well, no, I but, think but you see, the idea, the idea is, for instance, you, we talk about addiction, but when I talk to smokers and they say I'm addicted, uh, there are addictive qualities in nicotine. You are constantly revving yourself up. You're constantly hyping yourself up. The, the body gets used to the stimulant. But what a smoker does is he says, I'm addicted. Oh, me. And well. he sits back. Oh, I if was relieved. Him. Well, I was see, relieved. You know, it wasn't my will him. Right if there, you though. tell him that he is habituated, mm -hmm. most of his habit is habituation, is learned response, is learned investment learned. in his... Yeah, but the whole problem is learned response is mm -hmm. addiction. Ah, but it's ah. not a physical no, not addiction. Okay. okay, but it's yes. still addiction. Yes, it's a habit. And it's a it habit. doesn't matter if it is physical or mental, the same end yes. result comes but about. If, you have that darn cigarette. But, well, a smoker, but a smoker, if you tell him that he is at the power of something of which he has no control, Jude. he has to get his force behind uh, it. Uh, no, uh, no, the whole problem I, is, is if you try I to disagree. appeal to somebody on an intellectual basis, mm -hmm. he could care less. He's sitting there puffing away as he's nodding his head. Mm -hmm. you, our problem right here in talking about this whole thing is we are talking about associations. That's we are right. talking about being stuck with a habit. We are talking about addictions, mm -hmm. but we're not talking about where the habit is. We're not talking about the real cause of smoking. About the past 10 years or 15 years, these people have been hypnotized into smoking. By what? Conditioned mm -hmm. response. All right. They've been programmed. They're big brothers right? and sisters? Yes, they've been hypnotized. So advertised. what are we doing? Yes. You know what we're doing? We're de We're not hypnotizing them. We're de-hypnotizing them. We're convincing their subconscious that, hey, you don't have to smoke anymore. You feel good because you don't smoke. Well, I approach my smokers yeah. on a rational behavior. Mm -hmm. I think that they are adult people, and they can come to learn that if they feel that they've learned something, that they can unlearn it. It may take them time, but you see, they also okay, have it. That's the whole problem. Right. It takes time, and America today is not geared. Well, to that's why time. I brought up the thing America about is not a nation of patience. No, that's I right. want an that's instant solution oh, to the right. smoking oh, problem. Oh, oh, and it's not oh, but I must available. tell you, I must tell you, these smokers are great, and they're taking the time. I've seen it. We have seventy thousand of them that we've helped, who have ten night a week for nine weeks, and they come out of this feeling free, and they say. I can't believe that I've gotten away so easily from this thing I thought I would never get free of. And they've given their time. They have taken the time. They mean to get free, but they don't know how. They need instruction, a direction, well, they some need positive a, yeah. direction to help them get free. What would happen if the mm. government of the United States, since we now have the Surgeon General's report, simply one day decided that all cigarettes were unlawful? <laughs> and they were not going to be sold, all the machines <laughs> taken away. So how no, about a tobacco blight? 
that immediately go into the black yeah, market. Oh, right. <laughs> where all the tobacco plants would yeah. disappear on the face of the earth, right? We'd find them, Junie. <laughs> yes, you bet you, you <laughs> bet you. I'm here to tell you, have. we'd find them. Yes, what happened would. in Prohibition? <laughs> a lot right, of you know, people would thing. survive. A We'd lot start of people growing things learn. in our backyard. A lot of people. A lot of people are doing that now. Right. <laughs> well, we smoke something else. We smoke something I have to. Maybe it wouldn't be a bad yeah, idea. Right. I have to uh, break away for these announcements. And then I have to ask you all how you all you all are all ex-smokers. Right. right. How you quit before you found the various okay. programs. Okay. Right back after these announcements. So please stay tuned. Damon, how did you begin? How did you begin to quit smoke? I uh, oh, I how spent, did you quit smoking? How did I quit smoking? <laughs> so I can't right. ask a question tonight. I uh, I spent a number of years in broadcasting, radio primarily, and I was always a morning man, five to nine, right? Morning, and everybody. You can't, you betcha, you cannot become a morning man. You have to turn in your microphone if you don't smoke or drink coffee. Okay, I mean, that's part of the industry. So uh, one morning I'm on the air at like five thirty in the morning, and I kick off the mic and I light up a cigarette. And as I start to light it up, I look down in the ashtray, and there's another one burning. And I say, hmm, put this one out, put it back, turn around <laughs> and get a record, and there's another one burning behind me. Now I know I've got a problem because I'm the only guy in the studio. There's nobody else around, see? <laughs> so that's a problem. So for all these years, I have heard how tough it is to quit smoking. You go bananas, you get a divorce, you kill somebody, you know, you do anything. You get kick, fat. Kick the walls, mm, right? So I've said, well, I have heard that it's really tough. I'm going to try it. We'll see. This is a good time to see. I'm up to like three packs a day. So I crumple up the pack and I throw it away. Well, I get off the air at 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm walking around in the studio following people that are smoking, going right behind Out me. Out on the street looking you for a bet. bus. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm driving home from the studio and the telephone poles are looking like cigarettes. And I'm saying, oh, my God, i got to do something. The kids are walking around saying, please have a cigarette, anything. You know, don't beat me. So that night, I used self-hypnosis. Now... Uh, and the, oh, maybe about 80% of the technique that I'm using now, I use then on myself. And it was not totally successful. I used self-hypnosis three nights in a row, three evenings in a row. And uh, I have had two or three cigarettes since then, somewhere in that neighborhood. That's over six years ago. No, it's longer than that. Even. When was the last of the two or three cigarettes you They had? were done as, uh, not as a craving, but as part of what we did on, uh, on a TV thing. Oh, I see. And I didn't even inhale. It was just a, uh, you know, you a light one type of care thing. for a cigarette? Thank mm -hmm. you, no. <laughs> I'm an ex-smoker, but not a reformed smoker. All and there's right. a big difference. How'd you get off, Mary? Uh, I... June, I'm sorry. June. I was, saw a small little article in the New York Times that said they were giving a lecture on how to stop smoking at one of the high schools here in New York. And at that time, Donald Fredrickson, Dr. Fredrickson, was working for the health department. And they were operating at that time, I think, one of the first free clinics that there were in New York. And I went down to hear this lecture. Now, I really was not thinking about quitting. My friend said, well, you know, you seem to take such good care of yourself, but you're pumping all that poisonous gas into your stomach and that uh, into your lungs. So I went down there, and I thought there would be about... 20 or 30 people. Well, there were 200, and the butts were lined up outside <laughs> the doorway, and the doctor had to stand up and all take a deep breath, and we coughed ourselves silly. Well, he was very convincing, and he showed us a film, which was not scary, and which we show at the American Cancer Society, about how the body can repair itself. And I said, gee, you know, that makes sense. It's not too late for me. So I came back, and I got into a group of 12 men, uh, 12 people, six men and six women. Well, the 12 men chickened out and the six women went through. And we <laughs> went through, uh, it took me about two or three weeks, and I finally got down my last cigarette. I wanted to smoke at the Hotel Plaza in the Edwardian room for dinner, but my friend prevailed on me and said, no, Dad has asthma and he would like you not to smoke. And I said, okay, I will postpone that cigarette. Well, that cigarette I still have. So from that day forward, which was October 4th, 1968, around 7.30, I have not smoked. In other words, you have one more cigarette waiting for you somewhere down the road, <laughs> but you have not smoked it well, yet. Well, the cigarette habit is not thousands and thousands of cigarettes. It's just one. Mm -hmm. The first one. The first one. That's right. That's right. Although not really so, because the first one is a tough one. 
but we have oh. to learn to keep well, up with you, all those great looking guys in the leather jacket that go to market high and they're all right. back back in the back in the boys room smoking them and i got to learn how to do yes, it too yes but right. the idea is that that's why you started in the beginning why you do it now is an entirely different ball game that's right mm -hmm. exactly you and how did you quit oh it's a, such a story i I quit for 17 years, steadily, on and off. Every, every night way. when you went to bed. Every right? night when I, <laughs> every night when I go to bed. I'm not going to smoke anymore. Tomorrow I'm not going to smoke. And I wake up in the morning and I think, what is this important thing I'm not going to do today? Well, I'll have a cigarette and think about it because I couldn't <laughs> think unless I had a cigarette. Uh, but my husband was very much part of this. He was very much, un very unhappy because I smoked. He was a young dental student when I met him. And he began from the very moment we were married, practically, to try to teach me all the good, rational reasons why I should not smoke. And he explained the physiology and the pathology of smoking. And so I tried to quit repeatedly, off and on, on and off, for 17 years. I tried everything. I tried playing games with myself. I was very ingenious. I had devices to quit smoking you wouldn't believe. And I had, and I tried all of the local cancer society programs and the five-day thing. And I tried a few of the covert sensitization things myself. I, everything that came along. I read every book. And I would quit for a day or a week or a month, sometimes for two months, but I would be so miserable, so absolutely miserable without a cigarette that I felt life wasn't worth bothering with while I wasn't smoking. Up until tonight, I've never met anybody who quit who said I still, who has not said I still crave them. Well, I don't, Tom. Don't and you And I'll really? tell and you I why. Don't, I, I was so miserable no without a cigarette mm. that I felt finally that I simply couldn't live without a cigarette and that it was hopeless. And my husband and children were very distressed. And finally one day, about ten years ago, John, my husband, said, Jackie, you've got to find a way. I had tried, finally I tried a psychiatrist and I had gone to hypnosis and so on. All very unsuccessful for me. And he, I said, but how can I do it, John? I've tried everything. I surrender. I give up. I'm tired of quitting. I'm emotionally exhausted from quitting. And I feel like I'm not worth very much anyhow. My willpower must, I must have really no willpower. Really stink. Stink. I just had no regard for myself. So he said, Jackie, you've solved other problems. You've got to find the way for yourself. You've looked to the experts. There aren't any for you. You go back to the books. You find out about this madness, and you solve the problem for yourself. So I had a year sabbatical <laughs> from housework and children and uh, things like that. The children took care of things, and my husband did. And I researched it, and I looked into it, and I found all the mythology. It's a lot of baloney that they tell us. We smokers have had one of the greatest snow jobs about what the smoking problem really is and that it is a nasty little habit that's dependent upon your willpower and your marvelous intellect and all that sort of thing. It isn't. It isn't that at all. It's a very complicated problem that needs a very interesting and complicated solution. So I put all the things together that I knew I needed in order to break every part of the habit. I found 138 different elements that the smoking habit is. And I listed them and I decided how I could treat each one of those for myself to break it a conditioned response, or a need for oral gratification, or fatigue when I needed a pickup, or the social encounters, because I didn't think enough of myself to think that I could talk to someone like you without a cigarette. So I took them and I lined them up and I planned something for and each one of those things. dealt with each one in turn. Huh? And I put them in a long frame, because Dr. William James, uh, the psychologist, said it takes six weeks to learn or unlearn a new habit. I stretched it out, and I required that I continue to smoke during all of this while I broke the habit and gained control of it. Because the end result I wanted, Tom, was not to feel rotten and lousy and to resent life and that I was being deprived, but I wanted to feel free. I wanted to walk away from this thing and feel like I've added something to my life. And I did it, and I was so astonished when I came to my cutoff date. I was so surprised that I didn't have this nagging, compulsive desire for a cigarette. Everything I did used to have this I was free. I really physically and emotionally felt free. And I thought, this is unbelievable. It's unreal. The world really is so clean and so clear and so fresh. And I don't Isn't need to though? smoke. Isn't it, though, nice and fresh in here? <laughs> well, it's delicious. It, it has a different look when you stop smoking. Sure, it does. All right. And I, that w it was just a fantastic thing. I haven't gotten over it yet. Got to do a couple of announcements. We will continue in two minutes and five seconds. I have some people from smoking and anti-smoking points of view who are coming on, but I just wanted to spend a few last minutes here. 
uh, with the people who have successfully quit smoking. And June, I must, I, I guess I'm going to ask you the last question because okay. you are with the Cancer Society and theirs is a volunteer program that is free. I mean, there might be a $5 charge or something. That's but right. you're not in it for hundreds of dollars for the program or something like That's that. That's right. Is there a danger that people might go to some kind of a program uh, and they're going to get ripped off that, that the people really don't want to help? I mean, you have to use some care, I would think, in selecting a program to quit smoking. And I think maybe all of you would like a, 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 you know, to make a comment Definitely. on this. Definitely. Be the I mean, we've laughed about it, and but it's yeah. not just as simple as, uh, hey, you know, call your favorite hypnotist and he'll help you quit no, smoking I or think, something like that. I think that um, the best way, if you don't know too much about it, is to go by recommendation. What have been the results of people who have been there? Have they had a good experience? Let them explain it to you. Uh, the fact that, that uh, we're voluntary just uh, shows our enthusiasm for helping other people. We enjoy it. That's why I do it. I love doing what I do. Uh, we're very dedicated people. Uh, we feel that we do a service. And we are interested in the smoker himself. We're not interested in the money or anything like that. But if a smoker wants to know, he should shop around. Definitely. Ask people who have been there. Did, did it work for you? Did it help? Did they show you scary movies? Did, what did they do? And then the person can find out for himself. Or he can go to, say, an opening meeting and see what, mm -hmm. what he likes. Does your program guarantee results? You can't do that. Pretty much. You know, we ask people to smoke for the first five weeks and to return on the sixth week n as non uh, uh, not smoking. And we're there when they come back. Now, if they weren't going to stop smoking, we'd have to wear steel helmets or something. <laughs> they come back and they're not smoking. Our problem is euphoria. They come back flying. They say, I don't believe it. I don't believe I don't smoke anymore. I can't imagine I went through a week without smoking. So we don't, we can't guarantee it. It's counterproductive. The commitment to quit smoking is this whole business of motivation that we're talking about. And, and we force people to make this commitment little by little. The commitment to quit smoking becomes a very important part of the success, of their own success. If we guaranteed it, for instance, if anyone guaranteed it, it would be like building in a lifeboat. They say, well, if I don't make it this time, it's I can always too. go back yeah, and get right. a shot. Definitely. So, but it can't. It's too damn so it, important. So you have to guarantee it to yourself. And not, yes. Yeah. Okay. There, is, there are no guarantees. No. It's, it's there a is but it's one guarantee. Yeah, that's that's right. inside each inside individual. We are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but Jackie and June and Damon, thank you very much, and we'll spend a little time here after the announcements talking about the rights of non-smokers versus the rights of smokers, and I hope all of you will stay tuned. Again, thank you all very thank much. You, yes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Now on to the rights of smokers versus those people who do not. Connie Drath is an assistant to the president and spokesperson for the Washington-based Tobacco Institute. We know who they are, right, <laughs> folks? Main platforms for smokers' rights are characterized under the headings of health, enforcement, and freedom. Clara Gowen is uh, the founder of a group against smokers' pollution, which means gas. Yes. And you don't like people to smoke around you, huh? Right. Do you really think that if, if I were to, and I, I defer, I will not smoke in your presence because that is your preference, and as I said to you, I've had enough today that leaving it alone for 12 minutes is no great big deal. But how am I hurting you if I smoke in front of you? Well, we believe that smoking can be harmful to the non-smoker. It is your personal right to smoke. That's really your problem. Mm -hmm. But when we have to breathe your smoke, we're becoming involuntary smokers. I'm forcing my problem on you. Right. Okay. And we claim that we have the right to breathe clean air. So we're not against the smoker at all, and we're not against the right to smoke, but we are for the non-smoker and for the right to breathe clean air. We believe if you want to smoke, it's perfectly fine if you smoke in private or with other smokers. Now, you probably then would favor, like, for example, in the airplanes where they have the, the smoking and non-smoking sections, restaurants, etc. Exactly. We hope that smokers and non-smokers could each have separate facilities, I think that both smokers and non-smokers would appreciate this opportunity. Then the smoker wouldn't feel he's lighting up where he might offend other people. What if you and I went out to dinner? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what if you and I flew across the country together? Now, I, I'm here to tell you, I can't go five well, hours in a jet without separately. one. <laughs> <laughs> How does the Tobacco Institute feel about the rights of non-smokers? I'm sure they're all for them. 
Well, we disagree that this is a medical health problem in regard to the non-smoker. And unfortunately, there are so many groups now organized to legislate to ban smoking in public places, and they do this on a false premise. They say that smoking is hazardous to the non-smoker. They unfortunately overlook a lot of scientific evidence that points in the other direction. They speak from emotion rather than fact. And one very important scientific study was funded by the Massachusetts Lung Association last spring. Two Harvard doctors from the School of Public Health took a specially devised testing machine and went into a variety of public places. They found, not to anyone's great surprise, that the most smoke-filled public place was a cocktail lounge. With this special machine, they measured tobacco smoke concentrations in the air, and they found that in order for a non-smoker to inhale the equivalent of a single filter cigarette, that individual would have to remain in a smoky cocktail lounge for 100 hours consecutively. There are some people who would want to do that, Julia. I, I would think that this would pose a much greater threat to their liver than to their lungs. I, 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 must, I must say in response to that, though, uh, I, I do really understand how you must feel because many times uh, I am a smoker. And if I'm sitting in a restaurant where they line them all up next to each other at small tables and some person here lights up a cigar, I really get bothered by that. Some I, smokers do mine, too. Absolutely. And, or if, if I'm having dinner and not smoking. Right. Well, wh one and, of the reasons that the Tobacco Institute doesn't believe that smoke in the air can be harmful to the non-smoker is that they still are claiming that whether smoke is harmful to the smoker is still a question. They do not believe the reports of the United States Public Health Service, nor of all the health agencies that have done the research. There and with regard to that particular study, I know pulmonary physicians who doubt the validity of that one study you just cited. But the other studies, the ones that you people tend to point out so often, are based on conditions where they are totally artificial. Studies in which a number, a large number of people smoked in rooms with no ventilation. Some are under experimental conditions, but other measurements have been done in actual situations. The thing is, When Tom, you fly on an airplane, do you take smoking or non-smoking? I sit in the smoking section, although I am a non-smoker, because I enjoy the people in those sections to a much greater extent than in the non-smoking section. <laughs> I, I kid what you not. What are they not. smoking back there I where you I kid you sit? not. <laughs> well, you're, let I'm me really an involuntary <laughs> smoker rather than a non-smoker. Listen, I have to point out something very important. The tobacco industry, the cigarette manufacturers, recognize... Are interested in selling cigarettes. Well, that's indeed. That's their business. I don't deny that. They are interested. They, they admit readily that under certain conditions, under closed, ventilated air, poorly ventilated areas, smoking can be annoying to the non-smoker. And to the smoker. And to the smoker. can be bothersome. But is the remedy government intervention? Now, this is what many groups are advocating. And Clara, I, take, I exclude you from this category when I categorize these groups in general. But they are nothing more than shower adjusters. These people are those who, if we didn't lock our bathroom doors, would come in there and set the temperature of our bath water because they know what's best for us. I really this is think what's that's going an inaccurate on How the hell are they right getting cigarettes now. to bath water? Well, so the idea here, espoused by so many of these anti-smoking crusaders, is to ban smoking in public, take away a freedom of choice. Isn't discretion, good manners, courtesy, a more appropriate remedy? The majority of smokers... And I would like to think that because of people such as Clara, people such as myself have become a little more sensitive and a little more polite because I now realize that if I'm sitting at one table in a restaurant having cocktails and somebody else is having an expensive dinner, maybe it really isn't so nice of me to be keep blowing well, nicotine that's in their exactly face. The I, I really want you to, to know that thought. I feel that way. Wonderful. I'd, I'd there are other program hosts on, on, on television who, just because you're out here, would light one up to show you that we could smoke in your presence. But I wouldn't dream of doing that because it is not polite. Well, I certainly appreciate the fact I that you're not smoking. I don't ask for your appreciation, my sister in life, as we go through it in concert <laughs> with the universe. You are to expect it. But, you know, to carry through this uh, shower analogy, uh, I... Let's get back to the shower. <laughs> <This> <laughs> right. is, uh, you know, the tobacco... Something we ought to do The tobacco interest, shower. really, would have smokers showering in the living room and spraying everyone else with the water. And uh, groups like us are saying, get back in the bathroom and shower in private. 
But, and I think Clara, that's a more accurate analogy. The, the question is, do we want to bring government into this? Do we want to make smokers not only socially unacceptable, as is being done now in so many instances, social outcasts, but potentially criminals? Because in many places where laws have been enacted, the smoker can be arrested, fined, thrown in jail from 10 to 60 days for lighting up in an unconscious moment. I think well, it most would, it would be and wonderful if we did more need. pressing priorities, well, it, Clara. It would, like would be going out after if burglars and hold up people laws. and rapists and so forth. If everything was a matter of courtesy and we didn't need laws, no one would be happier than I. But we need laws for certain things. We need anti-littering laws. It would be nice if people would just First be First place, we prohibited smoking litter. in movie theaters since I'm a kid. They used to run it on the screen. Don't smoke in the theater. There are I certain places that. that should be off limits for smoking. And even the tobacco industry would agree. I was down through the Liggett and Myers uh, tobacco plant a couple of years ago. And would you believe they don't allow smoking on the manufacturing floor? You've got to Amazing. be careful. Fire hazards and so right. forth, that's totally so there, reasonable. There Listen, I'm out of time. Why does a non-smoker go around smoking. championshipping the right... Ch Listen to me, I can't even <laughs> think tonight. I'm so fogged up here with no cigarettes. Uh, championing, championing the rights of non-smokers. What, what do you care? <laughs> what do I Are care? Or the rights of smokers. The You're a non-smoker. I know I'm running the clock crazy. Well, I think that there are a lot of fanatics in this country, people that like to identify with causes, that would like to see the smoker made into a criminal, and I find that wrong. Smoker or non-smoker, I find that wrong. All right. Thank no one you. wants to make the smoker into a criminal at all. I got three seconds to say we'll be right back. <laughs> I know we did not have enough uh, conversation from Clara and Connie about the pros and cons of protecting the rights of smokers, but I'm just simply out of time because I went so long with the people who have quit smoking and maybe we can have them back. I hope so. Have a nice weekend. Thank you for watching and good night, everybody. The preceding program was a repeat. Tune in tomorrow night as The Tomorrow Show presents the Guinness Book of World Records.